Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and Podcast. Today, I am thrilled to have Dr. Jess Petros on as my guest. Dr. Jess, as she is known, is a former hospitalist, internal medicine doctor who now focuses on healing stealth infections and environmental toxicity. Jess, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. I'm, I appreciate it. I'm honored to be here as well. Awesome. Well, mold and environmental toxicity has been something that has come up so many times uh, with private patient advocacy clients I work with, with stories I've filmed for Wellbe and in different research. You know, it should come up in more research, honestly, because I think it's either the cause of or one of the contributing factors to so many different illnesses and chronic illnesses. But it's so interesting. And I have so many questions to ask you about it. So first of all, you're a former internal medicine hospitalist, which is a far cry from somebody who focuses on mold. Um, so yeah. what did you learn from your hospitalist experience that you use now? And, and what prompted you to seek out something different? How'd you, how'd you get to where you are basically? Sure. Yeah. You know, you're right. We weren't taught anything about really about mold in medical school. I mean, they tell us you can find, you know, certain mold balls, fungus balls in the lungs, and then it would show up in blood work and it would be this really simple diagnosis if it was the problem. And that's really not been my experience at all. And so when you go through conventional, traditional medical training, you know, they have this very cookbook way of teaching you. Now, granted, I've been out of school for a few years, so I don't want to date myself completely here, but um, yeah, they didn't, it was very me mechanical and left brained and there wasn't, they had taken the art out of medicine. It was very cookbook, very standard protocol. This is what you do if X, then Y. And so, you know, it was really rote memorization. <laughs> And that's, that's really how doctors got by is just straight memorization. And that's how they presented the information to us and wanted us to understand it a lot of the times. So, you know, it was years, it was years that I was out working as a hospitalist before there started to be kind of cracks in my world, if you will. I was, had moved across the country from the East coast to the West coast and was working as a hospitalist in one of the hospitals there in Portland, Oregon. And, you know, I started, you know, really being more public online blogging, you know, people at that point in time were coming out and making these claims about Monsanto. So I, you know, wasn't taught anything about GMOs. I would go research things and be like, wow, this is true. Why wasn't I taught this? And then when that happens, you start to kind of question all the foundation. And so that's what happened for me. And as naive as I was, I would kind of be like, well, other people want to do good for people too. They should know about this. So I would start talking to other doctors and I would start complaining about things like the food choices in the hospital or patients being discharged on a million medications when they left. Um, and I really was met with just staunch resistance. The doctors just said, listen, we know the system is broken. There's not a lot we can do about it. This is, you know, you're a, you're a peg in the wheel, right? Is basically what I was told. And, you know, if I continued or wrote things in the chart, they would call me disruptive and sit me down and give me warnings or slaps on the wrist and say, or say, you know, if you continue this, you can't continue to work for us. And at that point in time, I just knew what I was seeing was true and the system was really broken and I was having a hard time staying in it. So I laughed. I ended up quitting as a hospitalist. And to be honest with you, had I known how difficult it would be to build your business without a system in place for you, you know, holistic docs, they don't really have a system in place for them. You have to be a business entrepreneur as well. So I sort of did trial by fire without knowing and um, man, it was hard. I probably wouldn't have jumped so quickly had I, had I known what I know now. Um, but everything worked out as it does. It's in perfect divine timing. And now here we are. And my main focus is now more infectious disease, environmental toxins. And I wanted to get to the root cause for clients, for people I was talking to, for my patients at the time. And so that led me to mold, biotoxin illness and environmental toxins. Wow. So it was really through working with clients once you were, or patients, once you were out of the conventional system that you saw how many of them had mold toxicity and how much that came up and different environmental toxins and things like that. You that know, it's, sense. 
It's weird though, because there are plenty of doctors, conventional doctors that are told about mold or parasites and they choose not to hear. So I really think the key take home point with all this is that I just chose to believe patients rather than the system. Yeah, that's a great point because um, there's a lot of things you could be learning through your patients or through your practice or through your cases that you're just kind of choosing not to was a whole different topic, which we could dive deep into. Um, but on the topic of toxin bioaccumulation, which is basically just toxins building up in your body, if it's a fancier word for it. Can you talk us through when, you know, you, your body might need to have more detoxification support? Like I think it's so hard for people to know because there's so many detox teas and detox therapies <laughs> and stuff like, is my body detoxing out as much as it should be at this point, or at, you know, are those systems, my detox pathways or detox systems working as they should? Like, how do, how do I know they aren't? And, you know, when do I need more detoxification support? It's a great question. So, you know, I think people like you brought up detox teas, right. Um, which drives me crazy, but they're, they're a thing. And really people have the same sort of mentality that they do in conventional medicine and the systems raise them. So it's not their fault, but you can't just take a pill or a tea to re-regulate the body, right? You have to have um, a little bit more. And when I ask, you know, when I, when I sit you down and I talk to all of you guys, it's simple enough for a child to understand, you know, how does your body naturally get rid of, of toxins, not with tea, but by peeing, pooping, sweating, all these different bowel movement, right? All these different ways that your body is naturally built to release things. But when our natural systems are overburdened, we start to come down with labels and chronic diseases and things like that. And so some, some really good ways to know if you might be you know, stagnant in one of your detox or drainage pathways, or you might need to kind of help your body out throw your body a bone, maybe your liver needs some support or TLC, maybe your digestion is really off. These are warning signs that our body gives us. And oftentimes we've not been taught properly that they're warning signs. We think our body's malfunctioning, but it's really just saying, hey, pay attention here. There's something that's awry and you're gonna miss it if you keep ignoring this. And so I tell people, it's like your check engine light coming on on your dashboard and you just put a, a Band-Aid over it and keep driving. Um, that's really literally the same thing that we've learned to do in this country. And so if you guys are like chronically having headaches and fatigue, if you're chronically bloated, um, if you're chronically constipated, if you know, you, you're in bed eight hours and then you get up the next day and you feel like you got hit by a truck, if you always have itchy skin and rashes, if you have mood swings and the irritability, um, depression, anxiety, all that stuff doesn't indicate there's something wrong with your genes. It indicates that you have something possibly overloaded or stuck inside your body or an ex a continuous exposure that you're not aware of that's actually causing you to feel ill. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've spoken to a lot of different experts on this show about how genetics play a role, but such a small role. And so these uh, manifestations of a symptom or of a disease in a chronic way are almost always there to say, hey, something you've been doing or exposed to for a while now is causing me to not work or to, you know, so I don't like this, please, please adjust. <laughs> not like, hey, you know, you've had this terrible gene forever and like somehow I'm just going to present myself to you in this weird symptom. It's such um, a good way to say that, yes. So so I, I love that you present what you're talking about the same way because it's very consistent with what I've heard otherwise. Um, but how can environmental toxicity affect other detox pathways and system function in our body? So things like endocrine or hormone function, immune function, menstruation, mm -hmm. uh, chronic inflammation, and then also food sensitivities and intolerances. Yeah. So that's a great question. You know, everyone always says inflammation is the root cause of chronic disease and it's right, like unchecked inflammation, but I want to step further, further, what causes that inflammation? Um, what is the reason for that? You know, and you also mentioned something else. You said hormones, hormones, um, are a great way to kind of be, they're chemical communicators, right? They're not root cause. If they're skewed or abnormal, or you feel like your cycles are off, if you're a woman, 
woman or your maybe your libido is off if you're a man, um, that can indicate those chemical communicators are awry for a reason. They're not just kind of offline, um, if you, especially if you're pre-menopausal age for no reason. Um, there's something there that your body is warning you about. And I tell women all the time, PMS is common. It's not normal. You shouldn't have to lay in bed and writhe around. And some of them actually get sick. Um, that's not normal. And so, you know, a lot of these drainage pathways can manifest in hormonal issues, like you mentioned with the liver, um, which is a little harder to screen, right? We don't have, you know, the liver doesn't like you know, poop things out like our bowels do, for example. So how do you test a liver? Um, you know, I have certain questions and they're not foolproof or perfect, but they're the best I've got so far. And they're things like, how do you react if you have coffee in the morning? Do you get a threshold where you get jittery or you panicky or you won't sleep at night or something like that? Um, you know, how do you do with alcohol? Do you get horrid hangovers? Um, are you a lightweight? Do you never want to drink again? Um, you know, how do you do with fasting all day? If I was going to ask you to water fast all day, would you be hangry? Would you kill your husband? You know, these are things that your body should be able to kind of regulate. And even though it's a stressor, it doesn't necessarily throw you off your game and make you not be able to compete, complete your activities of daily living, right? So if these things are happening, we need to question. I was going to say, what, what is the, uh, what, what would you then, what's your conclusion if somebody uh, does get jittery with caffeine? Because I don't. <laughs> So it can be a number of things. So remember, I can't combine that with those other two questions. But if it's just that one in like singularity, that's by itself. You do okay with alcohol if you're going to drink. I mean, I know you can't right now, but if <laughs> before, if you're going to drink and then if you're going to fast, you're okay, right? I don't know if I, I mean, I, I've felt hungover in my life. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say having one glass of wine would do that. Okay, good. That's good. That's a good kind of tester for me. Some people have one sip, one glass, and they are done for two days. So oh that's a, mm -hmm, that is a problem with the liver. And so, uh, you know, caffeine in general, and especially coffee, people usually do this with coffee. And there are some times that I have a little bit of a harder time with coffee in the mornings and other times I do great. So sometimes it's just about your cortisol axis too. You may have a genetic snip, which is a it's like a piano key that's pressed on the piano, right? These are like our genes that are turned on or off. You may have a genetic step where you're a slow or fast metabolizer of caffeine. And I right? did see in my 23 and me results that I was like, I could have less than the average person. So there you go. So there's a little bit there that's a little of a genetic predisposition, but there are some people who can kind of, you know, do a liver cleanse or complete some sort of liver detox. And they may notice that they have a little bit more grounding and footing with caffeine and just with their cortisol axis in general in the morning. That's very much connected to the liver. Got it. Yeah. Good, good to know. Okay. So, you know, what do, what do you suggest someone do first when they believe they might have some environmental toxicity, whether that's mold toxicity or, you know, heavy metal toxicity or, you know, or even tell me what are the other main ones that you see besides those two? So um, mold toxicity, heavy metal toxicity. Now, a lot of these things overlap, right? So without, you know, specific testing, sometimes you don't know, but uh, I'm not a big tester. I just need to know one or two major things that are in people. And you can pretty much assume that everyone's going to have flame retardants. Everyone's going to have plastics. Um, it's just the unfortunate truth nowadays that we're all exposed to this and most of us in utero, sadly. And so, you know, with, with mold and heavy metals, mold encompasses, uh, mold and lime are very similar. They are falling under the umbrella of biotoxin illness. So therefore a lot of the symptoms overlap and there are things like you know, joint pains, brain fog, fatigue. Um, with mold, people sometimes get static shocks on the extremities. They'll get, they'll be unable to hold their urine. I mean, bad. Like, and then it'll be like urgency and frequency, almost like, you know, you might be thirsty, almost like a diabetes diagnosis. You know, heavy metals, people have a lot of mood dysregulation, um, a lot of fatigue thyroid issues. So there's a lot of endocrine hormonal problems with heavy metals. Um, and I actually feel, and this is just my personal opinion. I actually feel like corporate man-made toxicities are a bigger problem than heavy metals in most places. Sorry, you said corporate made? 
corporate man-made, you know, like corporate man-made. So meaning yeah. plastics and flame retardants and things like that. Yeah. Pesticides. I, I totally understand and agree with that from the, you know, information I have as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what would you say? I mean, it seems like getting targeted testing is the first step if somebody thinks they have something like this. But in addition to that, you know, mold, mm-hmm. from what I've seen, if somebody suspects they have mold in their home, mm-hmm. there's a real range of options after that that are both in expense, but also in effective investigation. Correct. Yes. Uh, so would you mind walking us through some of those and what your recommendations are? Because the couple of dollars for like a mold test or a DIY mold test versus like thousands of dollars, maybe for some sort of very skilled mold specialist, that's a huge difference. Like what's really necessary? Huge difference. That's a great question. And it's sort of, there's a, a gray area here because, you know, I wish I could vet all of the mold inspectors out there and, you know, most of them probably should be put through schooling, to be honest with you. So they have some sort of standardized training and they understand the detri- det- detriments of mold, but this isn't going to happen until the medical system is awake to it either. So we are going to have to kind of do the legwork ourselves here. And so I really don't like to find mold in people's homes. It's the worst part of my job telling them they have to spend thousands of dollars to remediate or move out. Um, And that's really the only good options because avoidance in environmental medicine is key to healing. You have to avoid what's making you sick. And so You know, I do go with a national company. Yes, we inspect, which is through mold finders. But again, it's this is not cheap if this is found in your house. So a lot of times what I tell people is do the 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 air inspection test, the ERMI test, um, the EMA test, whatever you decide to do that it stands for environmental relative moldy index. You can order it online yourself. Do that test first and make sure you've got the mold in there. You don't necessarily have to have an inspector come to your house to to diagnose the problem. You can actually get a relatively affordable $300 to $400 test online. And you know, one of them t- even looks for gram negative bacteria, which also grows in water damaged homes. And we forget about that. And so it's really nice to, if you've had suspect water damage or moisture in the home, anything like that, to be able to have that at your fingertips and empower yourself to order an affordable test. And that way you're not spending thousands of dollars on someone to come and diagnose. Now, if the test comes back and it's too high, it looks like it's too high, you're in the danger zone. Now, what do you do? Um, I really in- encourage people to go online and read and, and vet the people, the mold inspectors that you find in your area. If they're local, they should understand the detriments of mold. They should even maybe even talk about it on their website for you guys. I mean, they really should not be calling this just an allergy and just spraying things with bleach when they go in there. Um, That actually makes mold worse. You really want someone who um, isn't going to use chemicals and fog the home. You really want someone who understands that porous things need to be cut out um, and mold isn't always visible. It's seen behind the walls. And most of the time you're looking for water damage, not mold growth. And so a lot of people in the industry don't understand understand that, which is why I go often with mold finders. And yes, we inspect because for me, you know, if the people have the means, I really want to make sure they have things done right. And that that I can't cut corners of something with mold after what I know, I wouldn't sleep at night. Um, You know, if people can't afford it, we may have to try something different and work other ways with them until we can get them somewhere safer. That makes a lot of sense. That's all great Uh, information that I think would be helpful to my whole community because I do get questions like that from time to time. And I know that eventually, if you think it's there, having an, you know, an experienced, skilled specialist come is important, but I didn't know that there was this other thing you could do first, which is great um, because I just, I hate having to give someone just like you news that yes, you're going to have to spend thousands of dollars to get this figured out. So I know it's, it's, it's the worst part of my job to begin with as a patient advocate to say, you know, I think, unfortunately, based on what you're telling me, you're going to have to spend more money because 
you know, usually at that point they spend so much money already and it's like, they just don't, you know, and no one figures it out. No one knows it's their house. And then people also don't want to be told it's their home. You know, people are very, they're prideful. They love their homes. Um, yeah. and I want to stress, just take this take home point with people about mold is I've seen it in brand new builds. It has nothing to do with your hygiene or anything to do with what you've done as a homeowner. It's literally the way we build modern homes and energy efficient homes because normally nature would have airflow to help take care and contain water damage. But because we build energy efficient homes, we've taken that away. And so it really, it's unfortunate. It's a product of the system. So it has nothing to do with you. Yes, uh, that, that's great to hear from you, but I, I definitely understand that it's almost always kind of in the building phase, not the living phase, um, that these things either have a place to manifest or already have begun. And like you said, you can't see it and sometimes you can't smell it and uh, you could be living with it really unknowingly, especially if you have basements, um, you know, and other things like that, or like a back bathroom that nobody uses where it could just kind of, and it know, has this after. vent and no one knows where it goes. And some of them go to the attic. So you have like a mold sandwich. Yes, exactly. Okay. So also on the topic of what someone should do first, you focus a lot on microbial infections, not just pollutant or environmental toxicity. So what do you do when, or what should someone do when they believe that you know, they have a microbial or a parasitic infection or something like that. So, you know, people in general, if you guys think someone has a parasite, you probably think it's pretty exotic. Um, you're like, where'd you go? You know, somewhere down in the Caribbean or, you know, South America, people don't under quite understand that it can be something that's fairly common and their tests are a bit lacking. Um, you know, I've heard different parasitologists and things say different, but I think the mainstream conventional medicine, medical system is really not got this on their radar unless you're living somewhere endemic that they know of. So in general, parasites have some, some specific symptoms, but they also have symptoms that overlap with things like Lyme, mold. Um, they're often co-infections with Lyme. Uh, and so parasites often will cause grinding of the teeth. People have sore jaws and TMJ. Um, they may have intermittent anal itching, especially around full moons. They may have insomnia and anxiety around full moons because parasites actually are more uh, mobile and active when there's less melatonin and more serotonin during a full moon. And so people, you may not even notice that that's what parasites are. I've seen people have muscle twitches and fasciculations from them. Um, some people have a big problem with viruses because a lot of viruses can hide inside parasites. And, you know, I would say for bacterial infections like Lyme, things like that, um, unless some of Lyme's co-infections, those are really the big ones you have to worry about. Some of the other staff, MRSA, um, some of the soil-based organisms can be pretty gnarly as well. Um, but Lyme in general, you got to think things like brain fog, joint pains, uh, autoimmunity as well. There's a lot of different um, symptoms that come from these stealth infections because they really are a big gun that swings the immune system out of homeostasis. So when that happens, a lot of different diagnoses based on your genetic predisposition can occur. If people think they have parasites, guys, testing isn't really accurate. Um, it gets missed all the time. So I really go more by patient symptoms, exposures, and their history, which I track pretty well when they, if they come in to see me or in the past. And um, I would say... Really the first step for anyone, whether you're dealing with a bacteria or a parasite or even a yeast is to make sure that your drainage pathways are open because if something is stuck inside you, it's usually not the pathogen that's the problem. There's a toxin overload somewhere because the pathogens are usually attracted to disease tissue. So the problem is the toxins and something that's stuck there that's attracting them, right? The mosquitoes are attracted to the pond scum, not the pond. So I start everyone with cleaning the pond scum and on the pond first. You have to be able to dump the toxins that you're exposed to that are attracting those pathogens. And I really don't want to go in and kill, 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 kill what shouldn't be there unless we fully understand if the body is working at peak performance. Well, of course, now you have to tell us what, you know, how do you clean out the pond scum? Uh, what's that process look like? 
So with, it's a big process. It's usually, you know, that's sometimes take most of the consult with a patient. I'm just trying to figure out where they're jammed, where they're stagnant, where they need help. Sometimes it's all everywhere that they can possibly dump toxins in stock. Sometimes it's just one or two. So for everyone's treatment plan or what they decide to do about it, it looks different. It's very tailored because everyone has different things that are blocked or different exposures. I like to try and find something that really works on, you know, say the liver, the bile, energy, sometimes hormonal if people need it. I try not to. I try to go to the root cause, which is usually toxins and pathogens causing hormonal issues, but sometimes hormonal. And, you know, bowels, digestion, all that stuff needs to be addressed. And really when we've got people, you know, going to the bathroom, their liver functions better, their food sensitivities are kind of calming down, their inflammation's calming down, their pain is decreasing, then, you know, we know they're kind of in more normalcy, their body's not in balance. They feel more like a healthy version of themselves just by opening those drainage pathways. I like CellCore because they packaged a phase one, which has a product for each drainage pathway. So the whole month on that phase one is spent opening those drainage drainage or detox pathways up um, before you go into any sort of kill or detox phase you may need in the ne- in the following months. Before CellCore, I would just really mix and match products on my own, something for, you know, mitochondria, which is energy. If people are super, super fatigued and lack stamina, um, some definitely something for digestion, for their bowels, making the, they cannot be constipated um, during any sort of detox. That's probably the biggest no-no. And, you know, you can do some of these things even without supplements. You know, you can go get in a sauna. You can think about, um, you know, Epsom salt baths, castor oil packs, uh, rebounding, dry brushing, all the enemas if you're a seasoned detox pro. But all of these things help to prepare the body before you go into a de- an actual kill phase of the detox, you're kind of, you're more stabilized, if you will. I have heard that from working with, you know, different uh, kinds of doctors with private patient advocacy clients. You know, there's a lot of, there were, there have been clients of mine who were very, you know, whether Lyme patients or others really adamant to get to the kill phase. Like, I just want these mm-hmm. bugs dead. I can't believe how much they've done to me. And yes very hard to explain and get (laughs) through that. Like we're full of bugs. They're not the enemy. It's really all the other things that are creating an environment in which these bugs can survive that we need to tackle first. And the killing phase won't be effective if you haven't really uh, gotten your detox pathways optimized because there'll be all this sludge or ponds come, as you were saying, to mm-hmm. come out with nowhere to go. So then it goes right back into all of our tissue. That's why people feel either a flare or a relapse after they start to feel better. It's, it just went back, you know, right where it came from. So great to hear that all confirmed by you as well. I mean, it really makes logical sense when you just say it very simply like that. You know, I mean, I've literally had people look across a table for me and say, is it really just that simple? And, you know, yeah, a lot of us are sick because of modern society. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. So just logistically, if somebody, which almost I'm sure you've seen every time or almost every time uh, somebody has, let's say mold, they probably have or Lyme a couple of things at once, right? Because these things don't show up in isolation. It's probably Lyme and mold and candida and whatever. What do people tackle first? Like, I think there's a lot of overwhelm about hearing that they have a variety of things going on under the hood um, to try to figure out, you know, what is the most important thing to tackle before I, you know, move down the list. So I do something that may not be very traditional. I was actually talking to Dr. Darren Ingalls the other day on a a live Q&A, and he said the same thing, that he's in the same realm as me. He's a pretty prolific naturopathic doctor that I really respect. And he said the same thing that I believe, which he says, you know, some doctors say, you know, they go after one thing, then the next thing, the next thing is like, I don't really understand that um, because you can't, these things are so closely related and you know, our tests are not the Bible. They're lacking. So many of our tests are indirect antibody testing. Your, your immune system has to be properly working for things to show up positive or not. So, so many tests are lacking. We put, we make them the Bible. We gaslight patients about it. 
you know, with patients, they, they want these tests done, they want these diagnoses, and they want this sort of cookbook protocol to go through different mold first or lime first or whatever the doctor thinks is most important. Dr. Darren Angles and I were talking about how that didn't make sense to us. You know, really, we just want something that is effective. They have so many crossover symptoms. You need something that's sticky enough to pull things out molecularly and you need things, effective, good products that work to open people where they're closed and blocked off and no no supplement alone is enough. They're going to have to really change their lifestyle and do proactive extracurricular things on top of that, you know, their diet, you know, maybe move and not be sedentary as much. These are, these are things that people are going to have to do, but I never, ever say, first, we're going to go after mold, then we're going to have to go to Lyme, then we're going to go after parasites and then phthalates or whatever. You know, I have a protocol which, where I just don't even worry what their diagnosis is. They come to me ill. I'm going to work on making sure that all your organ systems work well. And then if you still don't feel well, which a lot of people feel better just after that, if you still don't feel well, then we may need to see, you know, I need to maybe need to verify some of my suspicions about what's in your body. Um, But once I know what it is, I have herbs and binders that help pull things out. And I don't always need to know exactly what the binder is pulling out. As long as I know it's effective, it doesn't strip their nutrition. Um, It's adding to their nutrition. Um, It's good for them. It's, it's safe and effective. And, you know, we're pulling out stuff that probably we don't even know about, honestly, with some of these clays and charcoals and active carbons. Got it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. You mentioned testing. Uh, Why is it so hard to figure out if you have mold toxicity or high levels of, you know, different heavy metals or a parasite in the conventional medical world, like where most people get their testing, right? What, what makes a stealth infection so stealthy? (laughs) Um, They have this thing they do, it's really intelligent, where they hide in what's known as a biofilm. Um, There are lots of herbs and essential oils that act as biofilm busters. That's why they're so highly regarded in natural medicine. But because these pathogens, when they form this biofilm, it's like, I describe it as the stuff on the teeth in your teeth in the morning when you wake up, it's, that's literally a biofilm. The bacteria in your mouth form it, um, and it acts as a barrier between them and your immune cells. It's, it's almost like they're, it makes them invisible to your immune system. Um, and that's why people talk about biofilm busters all the time. So that's a lot of what the pathogens will do um, is, is that makes them very stealthy when they can hide from your immune cells in the body. They also are stealthy because they don't just hide out in the bloodstream. They go underground. So, you know, when you first get sick with something like Lyme, I had this happen to one of my friend's husbands yesterday who ended in the emergency room. Um, He had a fever and joint pains and high liver enzymes and low platelets. And it was immediately tick associated illness that they missed. And so when she came to me, you know, I, he, he was so sick. I was like, you know, I think that, you know, if you just give him binders and herbs, we can turn this around. And they did, we did turn it around, but many of these pathogens, when they hit first initial hit, they're out in the bloodstream, the body sees them. This is when people like my friend's husband had a fever. He had all these joint pains. He was really sick. His body saw the pathogen. Um, If it hadn't been diagnosed and maybe just given two weeks of antibiotics, which isn't adequate, um, it would go hide underground. Um, These pathogens are often pleomorphic, which means they have the ability to change shape. So some going from a corkscrew bacteria into rolling into a ball or round bacteria and hiding and decreasing their metabolism so antibiotics don't get them. They hide out in joint fluid, in the crane, in the CNS, in the mucous membranes, not so much in the bloodstream after they go underground. And that's how they stay hidden from our body. Wow. So can the things we were just talking about be found with conventional testing? And if so, what should people ask for? Or do you really have to go more into this functional testing realm, which I think I sadly know the answer, but um, I just wanted to hear if you thought there was any way that some people can, I mean, for example, like I know you can get a mercury test, you know, from a conventional blood test. And sometimes I ask that that be added to mine or something like that, but you know, that's Those sorts thing. of things. They don't, they test these blood tests and it's not where heavy metals and pathogens hang out at, you know? Um, they need a hair test, for example, might be a little more accurate. I don't like to provocate heavy metals because you're pulling them out of tissues and bone 
with DMSA and things like that and then peeing them out. So you're being exposed again. So I don't like that route. Um, so I don't test for heavy metals a lot for that reason. You know, with the right other test, I would say with mold, they have no idea how to test for that. They're literally going to give you guys a blood test for antibodies to mold probably. Sometimes if you're really, really sick, those will be positive. But really that's not the best test for mold at all. I think a combination of a couple serum markers, maybe the Mycofix test or um, Mycotox test from Vibrant Labs or Great Plains, um, along with matching symptomatology is really the best way because we don't have a surefire test. And to be honest with you, testing is so unreliable. Um, I don't know if we ever will. And then with Lyme disease, you know, this is a big, huge controversy. This is why a lot of these patients are gaslit is because the testing is sorely inaccurate. ELISA misses up to 80% of patients and then Western blot, which is the confirmatory test, which many doctors just go straight to now. Um, that one still misses depending on where they are in their progression, 40 to 60% sometimes. So you're lucky if you get a, a positive Western blot evaluation, that means you absolutely have Lyme because that test is so inaccurate. Yep. I, uh, I've had Lyme. Lyme has been a big part of my family's history and my community. Um, I'm involved with the Johns Hopkins center for Lyme disease research oh. and the global Lyme Alliance and all the stuff. So I, yeah, don't even get awesome. started on Lyme. There's so much to talk about, but, um, I agree. A big part of the problem is the testing. And so the conventional doctor screening that says you don't have Lyme, you can just kind of light that on fire because that doesn't mean anything. You have, probably have to go do more in-depth testing slash work with somebody or, or you know, get mm -hmm. to a doctor like yourself who looks at the symptomatology as well, because so much of Lyme is really uh, symptom based. And then just, you can make assumptions as the head of basically Lyme disease research and, uh, epidemiologist. And, you know, I think kind of immunology type doctor at Johns Hopkins that will begin treatment based on symptoms sometimes, because he knows how inaccurate it is, despite That's being amazing. totally testing and, you know, science-based type person, he will admit that that's sometimes the way to go. So, um, yeah. anyway, tangent online, but that's very helpful about mold and also about um, heavy metal toxicity, that it's more effective if you think you might have heavy metal toxicity to get a hair test, for example, than um, a blood test. That's great to hear. Absolutely. Um, and I also, you know, yeah, I just don't recommend heavy metal testing. I would say yeah, you can, but that you, I wouldn't don't like, you know, bet the farm on it guys. Don't like think it's the Bible. Like this test is a hundred percent accurate. Like taking everything with a grain of salt, you can pretty much assume if you have toxicities and pathogens, you likely have heavy metals. Um, and I don't recommend chelation much either. It's like a last ditch effort if ever, if ever, because it can really strip the body. So I look for other ways to remove things like heavy metals and toxins usually. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So will you share a couple of your ways? I know you mentioned binders and herbs. Um, you know, are these um, herbs that kill microbes? Are these herbs that do, you know, just support detox pathways like the liver, et cetera? Um, and then what exactly are binders for someone who doesn't know what that is? And, you know, what are the tools in your tool belt for getting rid of these things? So I, I mentioned binders earlier in a couple examples. I said uh, activated charcoal, oh, active yes, carbons, yes, and right. zeolite and bentonite clay. Those are a few examples. There's a ton of binders. There's synthetic binders like cholestyramine, which I don't really like as much. Um, and there's natural binders. Um, I really think Cellcore makes the best binders. They have a HMET, which stands for heavy metal environmental toxicity binder that really um, goes systemic and doesn't just stay in the gut, which is really beneficial. Um, and then, you know, you think about how heavy metals naturally leave our body if we're exposed they leave through the urine the feces or sweat and actually um, there are many heavy metals that leave more effectively in small studies in sweat and um, so i that's a really effective way for people to kind of heal and empower themselves is taking a binder and getting in a sauna you know you're binding up things that don't belong in the body and then you're activating a pathway which we know can discrete things like pcbs and phthalates and some some heavy metals as well so it's a really powerful way um, we also think 
I think Dr. Klinghart uses ionic foot, foot baths for certain things like aluminum in the body. Um, I know it's really important as well to help people out with things like abnormal EMF or abnormal frequencies if they have things like heavy metals or mold as well. So that's something else to take into account. I'll just, for anyone who doesn't know the acronym, it, EMF is electromagnetic frequency, right? Related to radiation and, and Wi-Fi and things like that. So I, I talk about it, um, occasionally related to uh, invisible disruptors. So things that you're not seeing as far as like frequency and, and airwaves and stuff like that. 100%. Um, so are there ever any types of stealth infections or environmental toxicities where you recommend a pharmaceutical where like that, you know, this thing has to be dealt with that way? Or do you feel like there's no place for that in no. in these? I still, I still will write them, you know, I have a couple of patients or people who need narcotics and they don't abuse them, but they do need them. And we've tried everything else. Right. So there are a couple of people like that there. Are, I really still just write low dose naltroxone, if anything. And that's a, a medicine that can really help. It's not, it's not addictive, but it helps pulse the opiate receptors in the brain, which are linked to pain, of course, and sleep and mood and it helps reset everything for people with autoimmune problems. It's really beneficial. So I, there are some times I will do medicines like that, especially if patients ask for it. If someone comes in with a high blood pressure, that's pretty dangerous. I'm going to put them on you know, something right then because that's the treatment that's needed if you're in an emergent situation or more urgent situation. You know, sometimes if people are in severe cases or they have neurodegenerative conditions linked to mold, I will consider something like uh, vorconazole, which treats mold and yeast. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was talking about more so the, the heavy metals uh -huh. and the and the mold and stuff, any of those sorts of cases, do you, do you go to pharmaceuticals and sounds like, um, this one, say it again, full. Oh, voriconazole. Yeah. Voriconazole. Yeah. An occasion where that makes sense. Yeah. Right. There are some, and sometimes, you know, the holistic stuff can be every now and then more expensive or someone's insurance covers something that's synthetic. It's, you know, a risk benefit cost analysis for everyone and everyone's in a different situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. Okay. So what are your favorite, uh, slash what have you seen to be most effective as far as methods of detoxification? So you mentioned a bunch of different ones, but which ones do you feel like are really just the most, I want to say bang for your buck as far as cost, but also time, because what I've seen with private clients and so many others and myself is that, you know, taking the baths, doing the infrared sauna, doing the rebounding, also exercising, also meditation. It's very time consuming. And so it's very hard to make a habit, a new habit stick if you're trying to do five in one day. Um, and so which ones have you seen, you know, to, that people could really focus in on if they think they want to start some, you know, detoxification type extracurriculars, as you called it. Uh, but no, realistically, they're not going to create habits out of any of them if they're trying to do, you know, five every day. It's true. You know, you should pick maybe one or two every day. Um, I really think sauna is a big one. I do. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be infrared sauna. It's just sweating. So if you guys aren't move, moving or sweating every day, whether that be um, sitting in a sauna and, or, and triggering heat shock proteins, which really help your immune system in your, in your brain, or if it's, you know, moving your body to sweat, which is even better for most people, you know, one of those things needs to happen that packs a big bang for your buck. It can be 30 minutes to an hour every day. It helps you not only feel good, but look good too. It's very essential and cornerstone to health. In my opinion. Um, the other thing I think that people can do is, you know, enemas are great, but they're really time consuming and they're messy and they are not the magic bullet for everyone. Um, they really help with people who have a lot of digestive, sometimes biliary treat issues. It really helps, um, but they don't get everything that's stuck in the body out. I've seen it. I've seen people have cancer and do enemas and need more, obviously. 
Um, and so I really like those two things for detoxing really well, but obviously, you know, if people hate enemas, it's not their jam. I don't encourage you to listen to what I say. I encourage you to listen to your intuition about what you feel like your body needs and what feels good to you. Sometimes that might be myofascial release or a massage. And sometimes that self-care is more needed than any sort of like hardcore detox protocol that day. I have to say that myofascial release massage I did for, I want to say two years, every couple of weeks, I've had a scoliosis and lots of associated like back and hip and joint, yeah, not joint pain, but back and hip and, and neck uh, pain from the imbalance. And I will say that the, I used to end up at the chiropractor, you know, all the time. And every couple of weeks, I would say the massage made such a difference. And I would end up at the chiropractor once a year. Yeah, it was, it really changed it for me. And, uh, I had to experiment with a lot of different kinds of body, you know, therapies or body, body work, uh, before I found, uh, something that worked, but it was a combination of myofascial release and, and acupuncture that helped turn around something that's been going on for since I was 11 and my scoliosis first developed, you know? So I highly recommend myofascial release if you want to try it at a, you know, anybody who's listening. Um, yeah, I love that they did acupuncture with that's like a whole other level. Oh, not the same practitioner. Oh, I, okay. I would go acupuncture one week, myofascial release the next. And I just like alternated weeks. Yep. Um, and I found it was the combination of the two that really and me too. I'm doing fascia blasting and acupuncture. And why this works, you guys, is because you're kicking up dust at the construction site, sometimes with things like massages, myofascial release, fascia blasting. And if your lymph is weak and it doesn't move very well, it may just kind of flare things up for you and then settle, flare things up and settle. So if you go to acupuncture, actually opening up energy meridians, so the energy is able to release out of your body, it makes a huge difference. Yes. Well, I didn't know any of that, but I, it's what I decided was my little experiment and it was an experiment that worked. So I, I stuck with it, but okay. So we're, we're almost out of time, uh, shockingly, but I have um, just two more questions for you on this topic of, you know, stealth infections and environmental toxicity. What are the best ways to avoid ever getting one, you know, some of this environmental toxicity or a stealth infection for those of us who don't necessarily think we have, you know, don't have symptoms that would indicate we have one right now, but want to make sure we avoid one or also want to make sure we're not slowly building up, you know, bioaccumulating to bring it around to what we were talking about in the very beginning of the interview. Um, because, you know, prevention and avoidance, as you said, is, is a big part of it. It's huge. Yeah, that's huge. That's step number one, but we don't know what we don't know. Right. I mean, most of us don't know if we're living in mold, we wouldn't have done it, you know? So these things go easy on yourself, guys. I would say many of the things I've mentioned here are preventative. I like to catch people in that stage before they may still be having symptoms, but they don't have a number of different diagnoses or, you know, something as terrible as cancer. We can catch people before then and we can prevent things with lifestyle changes. Um, and if you guys were raised in a home where, you were fed M&Ms every day and no one in your household exercised and you weren't given good examples of what health was, it's not your fault, but you do have a little bit more of an uphill battle um, because it's hard to change and it's hard to do things that you don't want to do. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so just to give people a couple takeaways that, uh, you know, bullet point takeaways, the couple of things that you think are very preventative and helpful is definitely, you know, max or, or optimizing these detox pathways. So things that help you sweat. So things like an infrared sauna and regular exercise, um, mm -hmm. things that help you not be constipated. So hydration mm -hmm. and lots of fiber in your diet so that you are not constipated, obviously just hydration because you need to pee, which is one of the other detox pathways. And yes, um, minimizing things that dehydrate you like probably coffee, right. And alcohol mm. and then lymphatic drainage things, right. So things like rebounding and, um, 
dry brushing and a few of the others. Yeah. And then energy too. your mitochondria make all your energy. So um, if you're fatigued and you have a lot of brain fog, you're probably in the middle of an exposure or have something stuck in your body that doesn't belong there. That's really hurting They're your little energy makers. So, you know, really addressing all of those and building up that skill can help people regain their footing. Yeah. And then I think last but not least, as you were talking about, is just awareness. Like don't ignore if you might think you smell something musty or moldy in your home, or don't ignore if you read something about, you know, tuna having a lot of mercury and you've been eating a tuna fish sandwich, you know, a couple of times a week or every day, or, you know, you tend to always order fish when you're out at restaurants and you start having a couple symptoms, like connect those dots, you know, do that further research to try to find out if that's it, because it's much easier to actually solve, you know, mercury, you know, an overload of mercury by reducing your fish intake than it is to solve what might come way down the line because you were doing that for five years or 10 years or something like that. And you had no idea because it will go to something you know, significantly worse, that's a lot harder to reverse or bring those mercury levels down. Or even God forbid, you know, I being pregnant myself right now, if it was something that you you let a lot of mercury build up in your body and then you get pregnant and maybe you're not even having it when you're pregnant, but it's there, you know, that's affecting the brain of that child for yeah. their lives. And that's something you don't want to do. So I think awareness and not just thinking like, oh, that's random is the best thing you can do really, you know, connecting these dots for yourself. And I always say you are your own best health investigator. You know, you are, you know, really in charge and somebody can help you to figure out some clues, but you've got to have those clues and information to even present them with and, and mentioning everything and understanding that all these things could be connected because your work and my work sometimes involve wearing this investigator role, but people have to give us all the information in order to, they have to know what the information is, right? Right. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. All right. My last question for you, just based on the things that have been going on the last, you know, Hmm. 2020 and 2021, given all of your extensive knowledge on self-infections and the interconnectedness of all of these different symptoms and the root causes, what are your thoughts on post COVID syndrome? Because there's still so much that people don't understand about it, but I'm wondering if you've seen any parallels between the work you've been doing with, you know, the environmental toxicity and self infections, and then some of these commonly reported symptoms, which sound very similar to me that are considered to be post COVID symptoms. Yeah. They seem very much like parasitic or Lyme like to me. And these people yes, have been in fog, especially, and a couple of the other ones, uh, clotting stuff. I mean, this happens, um, with a lot of these other problems because Lyme can set off the inflammation cascade. People can actually caught as well. And so, you know, it's very reminiscent. These, you know, Lyme mold patients, they've been long haulers forever um, and no one's recognized them. So I think what's happening here is that whatever COVID is, it's a it's another pathogen that has the ability to swing the immune system out of balance, just like mold and Lyme and everything I was talking about earlier. And when they have the ability to do that, the body just sort of spins in that fashion until someone helps catch it or figures out what's going wrong. Most people end up get, getting put on Band-Aids, which address a problem and cause another problem downstream. And so that's where the whole system starts to fall apart. And we need to help catch people and say, okay, um, this pathogen has set off sort of a little bit of an autoimmunity type of picture for you. Um, that means there's something inside your body or something that's being misrepresented, misunderstood, or that's still stuck there. And I have had success with long haulers by really helping to focus on their mitochondrial dysfunction, which is a precursor for severe COVID. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I just felt like it was very timely to talk about it because in a way, COVID is a self-infection, right? It's not stealth. You can find it. You can easily test for it, but it's an infection. It's a microbe. Somehow people are putting it in a different camp, but it's, you know, part of the same cocktail of things that give us all these other brain fog and long hauler type symptoms, chronic symptoms from, you know, I mentioned Lyme a lot because that one I felt was most similar, but um, yeah. chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, all these kind of like, they don't really know what microbe is behind it. 
or what's behind it. Um, but we know it's a microbe and we know that it's just these other environmental toxicities, like probably heavy metals and mold and whatever that are creating an environment in somebody's gut and immune response in which they cannot deal with the Lyme or they cannot deal with the COVID when they should be able to, uh, if everything was working optimally. And I moderated a, a panel with the Johns Hopkins Center of Lyme Research that I was talking about, and the same doctors working on trying to bring more awareness to chronic Lyme being real in the medical community, uh, very conventional, as I said, you know, doctors, but who really recognize that this is a real thing have also been put on the COVID task force at Hopkins and a couple of other places and are trying to say the same thing and saying, hopefully the long hauler COVID patients and cases will bring more attention to these other self-infections that have been poo-pooed or gaslit in the medical community as far as like you couldn't possibly still be sick. Like you, you know, those antibiotics work, you're just, you know, making it up or whatever it is, because especially because the symptoms are so similar. I think it yes. just makes the case so clear that there are going to be long hauler type symptoms from microbial infections, full stop, whatever it is. And that testing is inaccurate um, PCR test. So we can admit that other tests should are inaccurate too. I hope later down the road. Exactly. Great. That's a great point. And how uh, many variations of an antibody test you can take now with COVID and, and how some are completely inaccurate based on, you know, a criteria that's set in the lab that they don't even explain to you. Um, huh. And it's all, I mean, I've had so many antibody tests now because I had COVID in November and the different labs are so different as far as what they give back to you and um, how they do it. And of course I dig into it, but a lot of people just say, oh yeah, I had a test. It said I was negative. So I must've never had it. And I'm immediately asking which lab was it a value versus just a positive negative. Like there's so many aspects of it that are nuanced. And I, you're right. I hope it sheds light on how inaccurate and nuanced all testing is, especially for these environmental toxicities and self-infections that you've been working with or working on. Yes. Yes. I completely 100% agree. I see a light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully. Yeah, me too. Or at least more awareness, um, which always leads to better understanding, I think, and then better tools being created and things like that. So Jess, thank you so much for this. Please tell the Wellbe community uh, where they can find you. I think some people listening to this might think, gosh, maybe, you know, I have X, Y, and Z and can go and get more information from you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I tell people there are tears to your involvement with me. If you want, I have a lot of free information on social media and I'm pretty active on there. I also have, um, a uh, regular website where you can go and read lots of educational blogs. And um, there's even an FAQ that the people online wrote questions into and I answered them on my FAQ. There's a whole how to do kill by and sweat, which is a protocol I utilize, utilize a lot with patients. Um, and that's all free information. If you would like a higher hierarchy or tier of my uh, knowledge and involvement. I have a subscription app on my website, app.drjessmd.com. And that is the ability to have bi-monthly webinars with me, live webinars, actually professionally formed, uh, professionally filmed education courses, root cause PDFs. And we actually have a community forum as well. So we're trying to stick it to Facebook. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, I hope everybody does go uh, interact with Jess in those places. Uh, if you think any of these things could be issues for you or somebody in your family. And uh, I want to thank you so much again for uh, giving us your time and your knowledge. It really helps uh, everybody in, increase their understanding and then they can go deeper and further in places that they think they might need to based on you know what they've heard today. So thank you again. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me.